not really, but what happens each time is we deal, we, we dive back into the uh, canon of it, if you would, you know, the mythology of it. And then somebody, somebody pops out of that almost inevitably. But funny enough, one of the characters I would love to be reacquainted with was Ironhide, who I, I, I loved that character and we killed him. Um, because we're before the Bay films, we could bring them back for a film or two. So I would say if there's one character in my mind that I would love to bring in, it's back in as Ironhide. Well, I think it's the original invention of it, frankly, tapped into something that's hard to, to exactly articulate, but this idea that an inanimate object can turn into a big 35 foot robot who can fight and talk and be a personality i think inherently that's a, just a really brilliant and then our job in a way is to keep that fresh you know our job is to each time bring in new elements so that the audience feels like they're getting the thing that they love about the transformers each time but then they're getting something new you know and it's that balance between new and familiar that we're always trying to push push you know, as much new in because it's for an audience, it's more exciting if it's new, you know, you get tired of the same old thing if you would. Um, but really we're leaning into the essential concept of it, which is, wow, this thing can talk, you know, and, and in this last movie between uh, Mirage and Optimus, you really saw underneath, if you would, the skin of the robot in a way we haven't done also. So that was part of the objective it was like well okay let's get to know optimus more other than he's the great leader and the great you know uh, writer of wrongs right you know and and in mirage's case can we make a speaking character have that kind of fun but also vulnerability you know our objective was to try to give a robot an arc we've never yeah. done Right. Even even Bumblebee really didn't have an arc in, in, in Bumblebee. You know, he's starts as wonderful and loving and ends as wonderful and loving. And he has a good friend. Beginning of Bumblebee, uh, we had this idea that he really didn't want to leave Cybertron. Right. And that as much as he orders a retreat, it's clearly something that doesn't sit right with him. So we thought that was an interesting thing to explore is like, OK, a guy like that retreats. Did I make the right decision? Um, do I? What, how do I get back and re-enter the fight? So what we wanted to do was sort of show uncertainty in a character that always had such certainty. And so, you know, in this case, doesn't trust humans at first and, and doesn't have a reason to trust them in a way, right? Doesn't sure, isn't sure his decision-making process was right. You know, like I think any great leader probably in the quiet of their mind go, well, was that the right decision, you know? Um, so I think that way, in a sense, it makes him more human. Well, I always have a little suspicion about Unicron because it's so big, how do you relate to it? And so, the you know, first of all, I love the idea of pursuing it because he's such a great villain, right? So that's, so you have two reactions. One is like, uh, it's a great villain, but... How do you do it in a sense to make it relatable? And one was, was and, and so really that opening scene in a sense is there to say to the audience, it's not just this big thing, it's powerful and it's gonna destroy planet and kill things. So that was really important to me in a way to establish why a planet can be dangerous because inherently you go planet, why, why is it dangerous, right? If you know the story, you get it. But if you don't know the story, and these kinds of movies, you're serving two audiences, one who know the mythology and one who don't know the mythology, you know? So right. you, you have to inform the ones that don't why we're bringing in this villain. Good question. No, I don't think so. I think what's interesting is everybody's so curious what the last scene is trying to tell, right? right. Uh, so what I, so I would, what I would say is it's telling us this that um, like every Transformers movie, there's usually a group of robots and humans that are gonna fight, stop the bad guy. Well, we're now adding some new meat to that story. We're gonna have some uh, other characters enter our story, but they're entering our story. We don't have a plan, that's our plan. It, you know, that they are gonna, be, and who would enter our story, that's that's for discussion. And, and, and you know, what's interesting is they have a lot of great characters. Um, and there will be a very active conversation of like, what is the melding of this group? 
we have a lot to, to, to digest, frankly, because that's what we do first is we go back to the source material and read it all, remind ourselves again, and then start going, well, that's cool, and that's cool, and how would it fit here? And all that stuff happens. I think, look, first of all, I think that's a great idea. It's one of the ones we've tossed around both in the animated world and in the live action world. I think since we're having new characters enter, I'm not sure that that would be a, a story too far for this movie, for the next one, because I think we're going to have to concentrate on how that all comes together and uni unified. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I do like that idea. It's something that's crossed our paths before. Uh, the animated movie is exploring the original relationship between what was then um, Orion Pax and D16, who become Megatron and, and Optimus, as you probably know. Um, so, you know, it's forefront in our mind in a way right now of what made them great friends, if you would. You know what? I, it might be because sometimes our art directors will do things like that and not tell us the motivation. Our feeling was, the, our rationale was that neither of them could afford new parts in a sense. And so the simple version was they're cobbling together old parts. And then obviously if, if Mirage was another movie, we would reintroduce, you know, in the meantime, he's gotten, he's gotten shiny again, right? <laughs> so it was really more about the fact that, that they had to do it piece by piece to put them together. I am fascinated by the idea of the inanimate object that it actually has, has a, a heart, if you would, right? Um, the Tin Man has a heart. Um, no, I think what's, it's the challenge of it each time. It's it's both the, the adventure of taking these things to these extraordinary places around the world, which is really exciting and also incredibly challenging. It's entertaining the audience, but fundamentally at the end of the day, what really keeps you going is when you do it right. And you get that experience of the audience laughing at the joke you were, or laughing at something you didn't even know was that funny, you know? Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I think some people look down on um, these kinds of movies and I don't think they understand the importance and the place in people's hearts. So what's so great for me is then you get the opportunity to touch people in that way around the world. You know, I, I met this uh, gardener in Malaysia on an island. I was, I was exploring, I, I like to do crazy exploration in jungles. And, and I had a transformer hat on and um, the guy comes up, I don't speak any Malay, but I, I know a little something and, and he's saying something to me and he's so animated looking at my cap. And so I found a guy who spoke Malay and then he started telling me how he's seen every movie and he's seen the most recent one five times and the first one he saw alone, then he brought his kids, then he brought his wife, then he brought his best friend. And, and it changes your opinion about what you're doing in a way, right? Because here's a guy in the middle of nowhere that it means so much. I gave him my hat and he now sends me every year, he sends me a picture of him and his hat and the hat is slowly degrading, you know? So I, I gotta figure out a way to get a new hat to him.